section 21? Um, would you give him the stack and then Jane needs one? Or the, or the, it's path. You're slacking here, buddy. You need one as well. You need, you need to be reading. It's right there. You are reading? All right, we all good? You, uh, Steve needs one. There you go. Is that the projector? Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Nice and quiet now. Good. Uh, part two, Christ, redemption. Andy, you're right back there? Okay, good. Is Mr. David distracting you? Because I can take care of him if you need me to. Make him go sit and time out over there. Uh, Christ, redemption, and grace. So, Andy, so, since you are uh, misbehaving... You get to answer the first question. What is our only hope in life and death? And Miss Emily can whisper the answer if she knows it. She just turned on the other side of her paper, so I'm not sure she knows it, though. <laughs> Jesus is our, yes, that we are not our own, but we belong to God. But Jesus will work, too. Uh, what is God? Creator of, and sustainer of everyone and everything. Jumping, next question, here, here we go. Andy, how many persons are there in God? Three persons, and uh, those persons are? All right, Andy's my back in the, back in the wind column over there. Uh, how and why did God create us? Denise. See, what does the pastor's wife pay attention? Yes, she does. <laughs> Survey says, God created male and female in his own image, for his glory. Jumping a few questions, will God allow our disobedience and idolatry to go unpunished? No, he deals with it um, in this life and in the life to come, uh, eternal punishment. And this is setting the stage for the Redeemer. Is there any way to escape punishment and be brought back into God's favor? I have to fix this slide, but it says God is righteously dealing with our sins and will punish them. Well, I have to fix it because it's the wrong answer. Yes, there is. He sends a redeemer. Uh, he sends a redeemer to save us. Then the following question, 20, who is the redeemer? Andy. Jesus is the redeemer. Oh, I will go back. Good. The only redeemer is the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal son of God in whom God became man and bore the penalty for our sin and for himself. Linda. Would you send me an email to fix question 19, please? Thank you. Linda always catches my gram grammatical errors. She probably already sent me one earlier. I saw that one. And she sends it to me, and I fix it tomorrow morning. So that actually really helps. I was actually bragging on her uh, yesterday. There, um, I was at 1122 yesterday for a pastor's conference, and I met the, like, the audiovisual guy. And he says his wife goes on Thursday nights and texts the people that do the booth to fix their slides. And I said, I have one of those too. And her name is Linda and she does a great job. Um, what sort of redeemer is needed to bring us back to God? The answer is one who is truly human and also truly God. So you may hear this term before the God man. We need a redeemer who is both God and both man to be able to help us. So let's delve into this a little bit. The proof text is Isaiah 9, 6, which is always the text that we read on the first weekend of Advent. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Let's jump over to Augustine, and let's see how Augustine answers this question. Christ, the only begotten Son of God, the true Son of Righteousness, and that's S-U-N, um, that's not a misprint. It's from the book of uh, Malachi. The Son of Righteousness will shine. And we have a Christmas hymn that says, um, Behold the Son of Righteousness. Behold the Son of Righteousness. What is it, Russell? Son of Righteousness. I'm singing it so well that all of you immediately think. But there is a, there's a Christmas hymn that we sing 
Uh, behold, the, I, think, I think it goes, behold the son of righteousness. Yes, it's S-U-N because of the Old Testament prophet. And, and yes, it will, somebody will figure it out by the end. We only have 15 hymns. So Russell, would you find that? Thank you. The true son of righteousness, so shown upon the earth as to not leave the heavens, remaining there eternally. So you have this image of the sun that is shining on the earth and bringing light to a dark world, but it's still in heaven. So coming to earth, but still remaining in heaven, but coming hither for a time. There determining the eternal days, here enduring the day of humanity, there living perpetually without the passage of time, here dying in time. There remaining in life without end, here freeing our life from the destruction of sin, of death. There God is with God, here he, he is God and man. Here he is light of light. Now that's coming um, verbiage from the Nicene Creed. Here the light which enlightens every man. The Lord took the form of a servant so that man might be turned to God. The word of the Father by whom all things were created was made flesh and was born in time for us. Where do you, do you recognize the verse that he's referencing there? The word made flesh. John chapter 1, the word made flesh and dwelt upon us. He, without those divine permission, no day completes its course, wished to have one day for his human birth. In the bosom of his father, he existed before all the cycles of ages, born of an earthly mother. The maker of man became man that he, the bread, might be hungry. And we, we actually um, sang that song, Guide me, O great Jehovah, bread of heaven, feed me that I may thirst no more. The irony of Jesus' temptation that for 40 days he went into the, the wilderness and did not eat. But he is called what? The bread that comes down from heaven. Um, he, that he, the fountain, might thirst. He, he, the light, might sleep. That he, the way, might be wearied by the journey. That he, the truth, might be accused by false witnesses. That he, the judge of the living and dead, might be bought, brought to trial by a mortal judge. That he, justice, might be condemned by the unjust. That he, disciple, might be disciplined, might be scourged with whips. That he, the foundation, might be suspended upon a cross. That courage might be weakened, that security might be wounded, that life might die. To endure these and similar indignities for us to free us unworthy creatures. He who existed as the Son of God before all ages, without a beginning, deigned to become the Son of Man. He did this, although he, was, he who submitted to such great evils for our sake had done no evil. And although we, who were the recipients of so much good at his hands, had done nothing to merit those benefits." I think that's a, the beautiful, what is it? Hark the herald angels sing. Yeah. Third, read, the, read the third verse for us. Of righteousness. Yes, very good. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, very good. One thing I want to do is in, in, in this is you see the, the, this paradox of God and man. Jesus is fully God. Jesus is fully man. And as we do, I want to look here at the deity of Christ. A lot of the, um, let me actually introduce this. It says, the deity of Christ by any standard, a fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith is no mere academic matter. And most um, false religions, false doctrines will attack the deity of Christ. That's where they go at. Let me give you some examples. A um, Arius in the 4th century. We learned a few months back about Athanasius. And Athanasius was the great church father who battled Arius. Arius did not want to, he was trying to avoid modalism. So he said, Jesus was not the son of God. He was a creature of God. Uh, he was a highly exalted creature, but he was not God himself. 
and Athanasius and Arius, that's where that, that first battle, Athanasius won, and that's why we believe he, he confirmed what Scripture taught and he solidified that in the church. We have the modern day equivalents of Arius as Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's Witness will come to your door and say, we love Jesus, Jesus is our Savior, Jesus does great things, he saved us from our sin, but he's not God. And that's where, and, and we're going to talk about this a little bit tonight, where you're going to go round and round and round in circles if you try to play their game. Chris knows. Uh, he kept texting me one day, and I said, are you sure this guy's not a Jehovah's Witness? And the guy was. The more he told me about him. And then also liberal theology will very much. When I say liberal theology, um, I am talking about those who deny the authority and inspiration of Scripture, that, um, that the Bible is not God's Word, but God's Word may be in the Bible. We just have to root around and find it a little bit. That Jesus did not physically rise again. It was uh, symbolic that he was a good leader. He taught us about God's love, but he was not God himself. And that's where, that's where liberal theology will attack is the deity of Christ. One of the a really good book in our library is J. Gresham um, Meacham, who was, uh, he was a professor at, at Westminster. He wrote a book called Christianity and Liberalism. It's in our church library. It's a very good read uh, about the importance of the doctrine of Scripture, the doctrine of Christ, and he goes through that. It's about 150 pages, but it's a classic, um, uh, defending the deity of Christ. Here's what will happen, and, and I, you tell me if this is true that when you talk to somebody who attacks the deity of Christ, they're going to tell you simply, well, find me a verse in the scriptures that will tell me that Jesus is God. There are seven of them that are very distinct. But when you open up the new, um, the, the new, uh, not no, what's the, New World, I wouldn't say New Living, but New Living is a good one. New World Translation, which is the official Jehovah's Witness Bible. And you turn to those seven chapters uh, seven verses, they're not going to read like the King James or the ESV or the NIV because their translators have monkeyed around and, and said, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was uh, with God and the Word was a God. And they do that with all the scriptures that talk about the Word or Jesus being God. They throw, their theology is superimposed on the text and they say a God. Or they, and they radically change that. So you're just going around in circles with them saying, well, your translation stinks, and they'll say yours does, and you, know, you both poke each other in the eye and then leave. And so it doesn't really accomplish everything. Um, but you have to remember, whenever we read, it's more than just a proof text. It's more than just saying, well, turn to this Bible, this verse here, this verse here. We have to interact with the text and what it's saying. So what I want to do this evening is give you some ways to look through this and to be able to speak to uh, people who attack the deity of Christ. First thing, and let me also say, if you ever say, that's a really good slide, all of my PowerPoints from these are online in a PDF. So you can pull it up and look at it down the future. If you ever want notes from my sermons in the morning, uh, I, I keep all of those. I have all that stuff. So if you ever want it, I'll give it to you. You can go online and get it, just, just so you know. A um, lot of stuff on this first slide. I didn't um, break it up. But the you first thing, when you see Jesus as being God, you look at the divine titles. And this is where we go and look at Scripture and says, Jesus is God. You have these one, two, three, seven, I think it is, six, seven, eight, um, that talk about Jesus as God. John 1, John 18, John 20. Uh, John 20 is that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and by, be, by believing you may have life in his name. Um, you have John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And what does it say? Word was God. And so you can immediately pinpoint those verses and say, right there, those are explicit um, uh, ways that the text is telling us that Jesus is God. But again, if you open up the Jehovah's Witness Bible, they're not going to read like the classic good translations uh, King James, ESV, NIV, uh, New American Standard. They're not going to read that way because they've monkeyed around with it. Then you go, uh, another example, 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. To those who have attained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our what? God 
and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, I believe the New World Translation says God and um, our Savior, Jesus Christ. So it's trying to split those, trying to make it two different people, and there's no substantiation whatsoever in the Greek to do that. Yes, um, absolutely, and yes, absolutely. And and there's there's people, and we talk about the text. There are scholars. We, we, we some of us have had the conversation: the King James versus the ESV, or the King James, and, and and those are all good translations. And there are scholars on both sides that talk about it and said, "This is why we like this." And then you make a decision and you choose which one. And and uh, but with those choices, you have great choices to go with. Now, with the New Living Translate, New World Translation, nobody knows who the scholars are. This ivory tower in Jehovah's Witness land sends that out, and they don't show any of the work. They don't show the scholars. It's honestly, it's a mess of a translation, but it's, it reflects what they want you to believe. So they, they change the Greek, they play around, and actually what they say is happening in the Greek isn't happening in the Greek, because how they translate was God, they say, they make an argument, but then they get down to this a little bit farther, and what they did here, they don't do in a few verses later. So they're very inconsistent in their application of Greek of the Greek so, but that's beside the point. What it's saying is there's divine titles that says Jesus is God. These texts here, explicitly. But is that the only reason that we believe Jesus is God? No, it's not. Good answer. We, as we work through, even if you said, whatever, Mr. Jehovah's Witness, who's knocking at my door. If you read John 1, it's very clear what the word is. From the context of reading it, the word is God, and he's doing what God does, and he's being called what God does, all of this stuff. It's, but what they're doing is they're denying all that. So the next thing we look at is Jesus as Lord. Here's another title that he has. The word Kyro, Kyrios is used to translate the name of the Lord 6,814 times in the Greek Old Testament, okay? So if you're a first century uh, Greek person who's reading the Old Testament, and then you pick up the New Testament, and it talks about Jesus the Lord, it's very significant that in the Greek it says Jesus the Lord. Why? You've just read the whole Old Testament, and what, how many times does it call, use that word Lord? Referring to God, 6,800 times. It's very consistent. Now, Wayne Grudem says the word Lord was the name of the one who is the creator and sustainer of heaven and earth, the omnipotent God. And so they take that title, and who do they apply it to? Jesus. So the writers of the text are making a very clear claim of who God is by what they call God and the words, the titles they use. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ. They could have stopped there, right? The Messiah. But what did they tack on to the end? The Lord. So in other words, God, who created the world, has now come, and your Messiah, God himself, is born today. This is a big deal. Go check him out. And they went and checked him out. Luke 1.43, because what a Jehovah's Witness will say, no, you call a Lord somebody who's your boss, your Lord, like Abraham called, or Sarah called Abraham Lord. Okay, that's sometimes, but most of the time it's referring to God. So you open up a, a, to Christ the Lord, it's not Christ the man who has respect, it's Christ the creator. Here's another thing. Mary, when uh, she went to see Elizabeth, Elizabeth responded by saying, why is it granted me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? She wasn't saying this older man with authority, because why? Jesus wasn't born. He was in the womb. It was referring to Christ the Lord, the Savior, the God creator. So you see the words they use. Here's another one, son of man. You ever think son of man just refers to he's, a, he's the, the son of mankind, he's the greatest of mankind? You ever think that? It's not right. 
And I'll tell you why. Because we think of that automatically, the human element. This is not a designation of the Lord's human nature. It is a divine title of the pre-existent Messiah who exercises universal and eternal uh, dominion. When Christ uses the word title, he is saying, I am the son of man that was promised in Daniel. Open up to Daniel chapter 7. <clears throat> I want you to see it. It's on the board, but I want you to see it. Right after Ezekiel. Daniel chapter 7. This is a very significant um, chapter in the book of Daniel. And we're going to start in verse 13. Uh, I saw the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a what? Son of man. Enter stage right. And he came to the ancient of days. This is God Almighty. And he was presented before him. We understand him as God the Father. And to him, the Son of Man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So this is a promise of the coming Messiah um, who will have universal and eternal dominion. This is God the Son. And when Jesus says son of man, he is saying that guy that Daniel was talking about or saw in a vision in Daniel chapter 7, that's me. And so you can't say, well, son of man, he must be a man, he must be a human. No, this is a divine title that's promised in Daniel chapter 7. These are explicit divine titles that Jesus receives in the text. Then you have divine functions things that are attributed to Jesus. The New Testament writers describe Jesus' function. He's creator. All things were created by him, and all things that were made through him, and nothing that was made exists without him. He is the Lord of providence. He's working all things together for good. He is upholding all things by the word of his power. He is judge. John and Matthew and Revelation speak of this. These are functions that only belong to God himself, these divine functions. Then you see divine attributes. The New Testament points to a very vivid picture of his attributes that Jesus possesses that can only be possessed by God, eternal and omnipotent. When the Pharisees came to Abraham and said, who do you think you are, you young whippersnapper? You're 30 years old. And Jesus says... Before Abraham was, I am. He is saying, I existed before Abraham existed. And actually, he used the very name of God that at the burning bush, Moses said, give me your name. And what did God tell Moses? I am. Now, they'll say, the, uh, a Jehovah's Witness will say, no, that's not that what that means. Read the next line. And it says the Pharisees picked up stones to stone him because of blasphemy. Pharisees knew full well what he was saying. And they didn't agree with him, so they were throwing stones at him to kill him because he was saying that he was God. There it's very clear who the New Testament says that he is. Revelation 1.8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, the Lord that divine title that's applied to Jesus, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. These are unique and untransferably divine attributes that Jesus has and is ascribed to. Then you have um, divine prerogative. New Testament explicitly portrays Jesus as the object of divine worship. Whenever an angel throughout Scripture appeared to a man and a man tried to bow down and worship that angel, what did that angel say? Don't do that. Don't do that. I'm a created being just like yours, like you. What does Jesus do? Jesus accepts that worship. When he saw him, I fell down at his feet as though dead. Acts 22, 6. And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sin, calling upon the name of Jesus. 
Ephesians 5, 19, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and make melody to who? The Lord. And that's, a, that's the title of Christ with your heart. What does Jesus's, the, our Redeemer's divine um, deity matter? It means that we have the right and the obligation to bow the knee to Jesus. It cannot be emphasized too strongly that if he is not God, we dare not worship him. And if he is not God, he is just like us in our sin. And there's nothing that we can do because if he is just human, he's in sin just like we are. So the question, the answers, uh, Josh Harris, he was the senior pastor in, in Maryland. He's actually now in uh, seminary out in uh, Vancouver, I believe it is, at Regent. What sort of redeemer is needed to bring us back to God? Uh, Josh Harris answers that question. You know, it's so important to understand the identity of Jesus, to be able to comprehend the mission that he accomplished. Uh, Jesus is both truly human and truly God, and we can't let go of either of those aspects of his personhood. You know, I think sometimes we make the mistake of thinking of Jesus as just another great hero in the Bible. You know, we've got Moses and we have David and Elijah, and then there's Jesus, and uh, all of them did great things. Jesus did great things, so what's the big deal? Well, there's no one else in Scripture like Jesus. There's no one else in the history of the world like Jesus. Only Jesus is truly human and truly God. And the reason that that's so important is that it means that Jesus can both represent us as human beings, but he's also able to overcome death and hell. I mean, think about this idea of representation. We have the Olympics every four years. Well, the only way that someone can represent a country and compete in the Olympics and win a medal for that country is for them to be a citizen from that nation. We can't send a horse uh, from the other side of the world to compete in a race <laughs> for a country. Right? First of all, it's a horse. But second of all, it's not a citizen of that nation. Well, Jesus is able to represent us before God. He's able to obey in our place and give us a righteousness that we couldn't have in and of ourselves. He's able to die in our place and pay for our sins because he is one of us. And yet he's also fully God. And that means that he can be the champion to do what none of us could do, who can obey perfectly the law of God and who can die a death that, that satisfies God's justice, absorbing all the wrath that our sins deserve. Jesus is the one we've all been longing for. Jesus is the, the champion that we all need. Jesus is the Savior who's come to redeem us. The identity of Jesus, uh, just to review what he said, common mistake that Jesus is just another hero. He's just another chapter in our children's Bible and pictures and all that stuff, and it's real nice. Um, he's just like Moses, David, Elijah, and Jesus. And, and some false religions will say that. That's what the, the Muslims say. They give him great honor. Muslims say that Jesus was virgin born. My question is, why would Allah send Jesus virgin born and not Muhammad and not the rest? There's something significant about Jesus. And you begin that conversation. Uh, incomparable. He is truly human and he is truly God. He is our representative, and the fact that he is human means he can represent us. Um, we don't send a horse from Zimbabwe to the Olympics. Why? Because he's a horse and he's from Zimbabwe. We send humans from our country to represent us when in the Olympics. And because Jesus is human, he could represent us before God on the cross. He could obey in our place, and he could die in our place. But the fact that he's God, he is righteous, and he is able to overcome what we cannot overcome. And he's be the champion that we can't. He is the city of refuge that we need. He is the righteousness. And I love this quote. Jesus is the one we've all been longing for, the champion we all need, the Savior who has come to redeem us. So we close with John Stott's prayer. On, uh, on page two, it says, Lord Jesus, eternal Son of God, made man, eternal Word of God made flesh, 
Break our stubborn hearts at the foot of your cross. Humble our proud hearts at the foot of your cross. Grant that we may linger there for time in eternity for your name's sake. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you. We thank you for the gift of the Redeemer who has come, who is truly God, who has overcome the things that hold us down, the sin that so easily entangles us. He's lived in righteousness. He has conquered death. And he has given us the victory because of his righteousness righteousness that has been applied to our account, that we may go forth in freedom and enjoy and enjoying the good gifts of this world for the glory of Christ who has redeemed us. In the name that is above all names and all God's people said,